Welcome. My name is Drew Thompson, and I am an associate professor here at the BGC and co-convener with uh, Meredith Lynn, Anissa Malvoisin, and Catherine Whalen of the seminar in Art and Material Culture of Africa and the African Diaspora. On behalf of my fellow co-conveners, I welcome you and our presenter today, Dr. Monica Miller, the Ann Whitney Olin Professor of English and Africana Studies at Barnard College. Dr. Miller situates her research at the center of many disciplines, including African and American literature and cultural studies. She is the author of the monograph, um, Slaves to Fashion, Black Dandyism and the Styling of Black Diasporic Identity, Duke University Press, which received the William Sanders Scarborough Prize for Best Book in African American Literature and Culture from the Modern Language Association, and was shortlisted for the 2010 Modernist Studies Association Book Prize. She is currently working at work on a second book project titled uh, Black Swedish Style, Race, Diaspora and Belonging. When reading Dr. Miller's work, one immediately gets an expansive and careful view of concepts that are critical to thinking about how people who identify as Black experience, construct, and move through the diaspora. Her extensive writing and cultural commentary have received support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Institute for Citizens and Scholars, formerly the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Dr. Miller serves as the faculty, uh, Dean for Faculty Diversity and Development and has directed the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program at Barnard College. Finally, a word on how today's event will run. Dr. Miller will speak for about 35 minutes and then we will open things up for questions and discussion. For the question and answer session, please use the Q&A function. We have a number of colleagues joining us as panelists. For the panelists, please use the raised hand function and I will call on you to uh, unmute and ask your question. We have automatic captioning, which, can turn, uh, which you can turn on using the CC option at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this event and a copy of the video will be available on our website and YouTube channels afterwards. And now I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Miller. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank um, Drew and all the co conveners um, for inviting me um, to speak today. Um, it's an honor. Um, I, I very much admire the work of the um, uh, grad center. I'm always interested in your program. So um, it's exciting to actually be um, a part of it. Um, time is limited. So I am actually going to kind of just jump right into today's, um, today's talk. And I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments uh, at the end of our time together. Um, section one, um, well, I'll give you the title, Rhizomatic Forms and Global Black Aesthetics. Um, this is section one called Brown Girls Dreaming. Crossing to Park Avenue from 68th Street, I walk uptown to the Swedish consulate. The consular residence, which I can see from afar as it is flying the Swedish flag, is a magnificent building, one of the only still intact private res residencies and single family homes on Park Avenue. I'm here for an event I couldn't have anticipated, a reception honoring Jacqueline Woodson, a beloved and prized author of young adult fiction, a queer black American woman who writes beautifully lyrical poetic books in which each word is chosen and perfectly placed each character loved and validated. The author of the lauded 2014 memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, she's being honored tonight as the 2018 recipient of the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Prize by Alice Ba Kunke, Sweden's Minister of Culture and Democracy. This is the world's largest and most prestigious award for children's literature. Appointed in 2014, Ba Kunke is currently Sweden's only governmental minister of African descent there has been one other. Her portfolio, portfolio includes civil society, culture, democracy and human rights, and media. She's got a lot on her plate, including the caretaking of this night of firsts. The reception is in full swing when I walk in. I meet Swedes in New York working in the cultural world. I meet Woodson's family. Her sister and I, the only black people in this magnificent room apart from Alice and Jacqueline, saw each other right away. I explain to them when they wonder who I am that I am duly invested in this meeting. 
as a scholar of African-American literature and culture currently working on a book about Afro-Swedish identity and art. When it's time for the toast, uh, the general consul Leif Pagrozzi calls everyone to attention and welcomes Woodson, lauding her as doing essential, necessary and profound work by telling stories that have been unacknowledged by stories, telling stories of those left behind. I wonder, left behind by who? He then introduces Bakunke, who is standing behind him, looking contemplative. When she takes the microphone, she begins slowly and deliberately as if collecting her thoughts. She introduces herself as the Minister of Culture who until very recently did not know about Jacqueline Woodson. An avid reader, and not only because of her current job, Bakunke explains as she wrinkles up her face that she did not know that Woodson existed. She is ashamed of this fact. In preparation for the trip and even on the flight to New York, she read Woodson's celebrated family memoir and verse, Brown Girl Dreaming. Captivated and compelled, she has since read two more of Woodson's novels. She stops talking and at one point just gazes at Woodson. And I realize that her reaction to the work is actually ironic, that she has no words for this author of books as she has been so moved. Reading within Woodson's worlds about the American South and people of African descent that she, Bakunke, understood she is connected to somehow, somewhere, somewhen, has been an ineffable experience. Finally, she reaches for Woodson and they embrace, brown girls dreaming. Taken to the podium, Woodson tells the audience with her wide gleaming smile that they started calling at 4.30 in the morning, they being the Astrid Lindgren Prize Committee, and we didn't answer. At around 6 a.m., she capitulated answering the phone, fearing that her 16-year-old daughter was calling downstairs for something urgent and learned that she'd won the prize. In shock, her first thought was, did they even give this award to Black people? Humbled that her work had been recognized at this level, that someone, indeed Sweden, can call with such possibilities, she warmly thanks her family and her editor, remarking that winning this award now means that a conversation can and will now take place across the ocean. In lieu of a longer speech, she then opens the book and reads from two chapters in Brown Girl Dreaming, but first indicates that this book is dedicated to the possibility that brown children like me can grow up free. February 12th, 1963. I am born not long ago from the time or far from the place where my grandparents worked the deep rich land, unfree, dawn till dusk, unpaid drank cool water from scooped out boards, looked up and followed the sky's mirrored constellation to freedom. I'm born as the South explodes, too many people, too many years enslaved, then emancipated, but not free. The people who look like me keep fighting and marching and getting killed so that today, February 12th, 1963, and every day from this moment on, brown children like me can grow up free, can grow up learning, and voting and walking and riding wherever we want. Woodson then turned the pages of her book and announced in conclusion that this one is about the ancestors. Tobacco. The old people used to say a pinch of dirt in the mouth can tell tobacco's story. What crops are ready for picking, what needs to be left to grow, what soil is rich enough for planting and the patches of land that need a year of rest. I do not know yet how sometimes the earth makes a promise it can never keep. Tobacco fields lay fallow, crops picked clean. My grandfather coughs again and the earth waits for what and who it will get in return. Two, what and who it will get in return. Black diasporic consciousness has, since at least the Harlem Renaissance, been expressed in terms of heritage. The depth and contour of the relation between the people, history, and culture of Africa to those transported from its shores and distributed around the world as a result of the slave trade and imperialism. The birth of this movement also entailed a search for cultural and aesthetic origins, beginnings from which African American and Afro diasporic culture coming out of the US at that time could develop and grow. This search took the form of questioning what was or could be inherited from an African birthright, as well as what recovered passed down and celebrated as part of a process of surviving centuries of unfreedom. While Park Avenue extends into Harlem, the area in which the Swedish consular residence is situated is indeed a different world. Looking uptown from Park Avenue after the event, 
I thought of Harlem, Sweden, and generally of roots, tradition, inheritance, and futures. Jacqueline Woodson's deep rootedness in revolutionary time and her faith in the potential of liberatory language stayed with me as I contemplated the family history she so lyrically shared. In February 12th in Tobacco, Woodson wonders what she has inherited from her family and social context, how and in what way she will mature from childhood to adulthood, negotiate what she hopes and even anticipates to be an explosive and inevitable, even naturalized process of personal, racial, and natural liberation. Understanding herself as emplaced within the nation, a part of its natural landscape, she asks about the ways in which she is ready, the nation is ready to grow and change. What interested me the night that Alice Bakunke met Jacqueline Woodson was a simultaneous presence, a proximity and distance, a fellow feeling and estrangement between this potential for the growth of liberatory discourse in African America and Afro Sweden. That this most prestigious prize had been given to Woodson would mean something practical yet profound in Sweden. As a result, Woodson would be translated into Swedish and Afro Swedish children would have another black writer with whom they could grow up. Woodson would be one of the very few, perhaps a handful of black writers of children's literature of any nationality and ethnicity to be available in Swedish. In fact, there's a paucity of black writers of Swedish descent who write at all, perhaps a very few for children. There are maybe a handful more white writers who have written books with complex and contemporary non-white children or young adult characters. Alice Balkunke's ineffable reaction to Woodson and her writing spoke volumes, I think, because she recognized something that she cannot always acknowledge that she sees and understands. What it means to grow up black or non-white in an overwhelmingly white place, subject to even imprisoned by, and in some cases internalizing and or resisting the racial logics of the surrounding landscape. Multiculturalism as an idea in social policy dates back to the 1980s and 1990s in Sweden, the time of the first significant wave of immigration into Sweden that generated both a hope for and a fear of a demographically and culturally new Sweden. In their 1990 book, Paradoxes of Multiculturalism, Alexander Åhlund and Karl Ulrich Schirup identify what they see as the fundamental contradictions of Sweden's multicultural experiment, contradictions that have become entrenched and have resulted in the crisis of multiculturalism that many perceive Sweden to have been in and to still be in today. For them, Sweden is indeed unique as compared to other nations, even other social democracies. They describe Sweden as a rather, this is them, a rather ennobled form of programmed society, which has an impressive ambition for participation and for a democratic trans-ethnic in interchange, which has hardly come onto the agenda anywhere else in Europe. But this ambition faltered, not because of its noble aim, but rather because of the way in which it was programmed. Swedish multiculturalism was undermined as it was being formulated because, this is them, its realization was left to the initiative of Sweden's institutions and to an enlightened technocracy, rather than to a communicative public exchange. This lack of public exchange is once again related to the startling silence that meets discussions about difference in Sweden, especially when those differences are racial, ethnic, cultural, and or religious. We can think of communicative public exchange, especially as located in the realm of the arts, culture, and media in the form of represent representativeness of this new Sweden that is a result not only of immigration, but also adoption, intermarriage or interracial relationships that are, can also be intercultural. Nearly 40 years on, this paradox of multiculturalism persists. We see it in relation to the we see it in relation to the reception in honor of Jacqueline Woodson, both in terms of Culture Minister Bakunke's official and perhaps personal relation to the occasion and her wordlessness in the moment. Art, culture, and media are coincidentally the charge of the Minister of Culture and Democracy. We see it as well on a larger scale in which, society, in, in which Swedish society's difficulty in including others of recognizing that they have, in Woodson's language, sowed and planted new and different seeds and now await, but refuse to recognize what and who it will get in return. Although the emerging black Swedish community is extremely diverse in national and ethnic origin and class and social location, racialization and racist discrimination based on their difference from whiteness unify their experiences to an extent when histories of immigration or emplacement might not. 
Today, I'd like to think about how retellings of growing up Black in Sweden explore the dichotomy between sameness experiences of being Black and Swedish, as well as those experiences and circumstances that provide what Tina Camp and Jacqueline Massey Brown have identified as potential diasporic resources, critical ideologies and conceptions of belonging that originate elsewhere in the Black diaspora. I'd like to think about these moments not only as decolonizing gestures, but moments that reach beyond that idea to formulate new relations to Blackness locally and globally in a particular kind of space and time. As it happens, I'm interested in exploring a new structure for this operation or transformation, geometry and the rhizome, as a way to express contemporary and emerging Black identities, as well as the potential for a global Black aesthetic that is both specific to sites of emergence and construction, and yet connected to a historical flow. Three, encapsulation and circulation. The debut novel of Afro-Swedish writer Lena Bezerwerk Grönland, Slog, is the story of Fikirte, a teenage girl growing up in an unnamed small Swedish town during the 1980s. It is not a typical immigrant story or a recognizable Bildungsroman. Instead, it is about a young woman navigating the shifting modes of time and space that characterize immigration and adolescence within a racist landscape, what she calls a sea of whiteness. I am part of my father's war. It was palpable between us, Tornetu. It is just that I haven't always understood how. Stories that are inherited are a weight that changes the person bearing it. Wakesh, are you following? Do you understand, Papa? The sea of whiteness, Nichu Bar, that I am falling into, that I talk about during the nights, the Tochu, what do you know about it? Slog, which means strike or hit, is a book of silences and pauses of lost histories and uncertain futures. Emmanuel, the young, man, young woman's father, a refugee and immigrant fleeing war in Ethiopia and family tragedy, won't talk to his daughter about his former life, his missing wife, her mother, the disappearance of her sister into Europe. Fakirte won't admit to her father that on her way home from school, she is preyed upon almost daily, a victim of verbal and physical racist abuse. Father and daughter are both fighting battles, real, imagined, present, and past in Swedish, and sometimes, as the text indicates, in italics, Amharic. What they cannot say, they embody when they enjoy a shared pastime, stepping into the boxing ring and working in intervals on their footwork and at the punching bag. Racism, especially when experienced by children, often defies articulation. It is told with an in, with, in silences. It is conversation that is muted and unsure. Slog tells Fakirte's story in this way at the level of narrative and also form. More poem than prose, Slog's short paragraph length chapters managed to tell with a minimum of words and in the cadence of a revelatory secret, the story of Fakirte's alienation from 1980s Swedish society and the way in which she literally and metaphorically fights back and articulates herself into a strange or foreign land. Declaring the open chapter of Slog that, and this is her, the landscape has always been a compass for me, it has led me. Fakirte also wonders as the rain falls from the sky when it ought to be snow. Sometimes I don't know, sometimes when I wake up, I forget which reality is mine. The competing realities plaguing her adolescence are multifold. When boxing or running, she creates and enjoys a rhythm of breath and body that tunes her into her surroundings and present reality. As inconvenient and challenging as the weather is, nothing prevents her from running in the forest, her haven. Those that throw stones or snow in the winter who yell after me until I'm out of their eyesight, they don't come here in the forest. I encounter near them near the edges of the field, but never on the paths, never in the forest. She feels this freedom and sense of escape only when running or sparring in the gym because sometimes I have felt that the punches against the bag take me closer to myself. This bodily and geographical dwelling stands in contrast to the exposure she feels when being harassed, targeted racially, or called the N-word, as if it were always winter and I always only had a thin dress. Though an inherently violent and individual sport, boxing, jabs, punches, hooks, and knockouts function as, among other things, a healing, community building, and identity reinforcing and constructing tool or diasporic resource and slog. Fakirte's father, Emmanuel, was a boxer in Ethiopia and remembers training as a family affair, as he and his brother often worked out with their other neighborhood children in a local gym. 
For them, boxing was a way to keep out of trouble, to rethink and work through the politics of race and colonialism locally and even globally. Prakirte's bedtime stories were stories of boxing inspired by the pictures of boxing legends, Jack Johnson, Muhammad Ali, Seifu Tuba, Joe Lewis, George Foreman, Archie Moore, Zora Fawley, that were hanging on the walls of a spare room in their apartment where they often went to talk about boxing and train. Listening to Habesha music while she runs, Niwe de Bebe, Ohio Lumergia, Fikirte counters everyday racism with everyday diasporic resources, becoming, as she says, new every time I ran. Not a typical first generation immigrant story, a typical buildings Roman, or some combination of both, in which there is a triumphal moment when she overcomes an obstacle, demonstrates her maturity, joins her Ethiopianness with her Swedishness, hyphenates. Prakirte's story is much more complex. It defies linearity and closure and hinges on her ability to love another like herself in a specific space time. Traveling to the southern city of Malmö for a boxing tournament, which incidentally she wins, she meets Tudros, a fellow teen boxer of Ethiopian and Eritrean parentage, who becomes for her an additional anchor in and means of passage between the worlds she navigates. Over long telephone conversations and then visits between their homes, Tudros and Fakirte build an intimacy that she describes as an existential relief and joy. Is that it is as if Tudros and I are in a bubble where I can rest for the first time as if I haven't slept for a long, long time, maybe never. We relax into each other, run and live in each other. The connection we have to each other is like a high. That which is happening is that everything is changing. The days are blurred. There are no boundaries anywhere around us. And it's like we've moved somewhere else. This other place is not foreign though. Instead it is an aspect of their present and places them both in nature and the built environment, transforms the landscape and creates other paths for their being. When they walk together down a main thoroughfare in an unnamed Swedish city, space and time open up. The familiar is made productively strange. We walk down Kungsgatan and it is as if the city changes with each step, as, we, as if we are walking in a painting that is being repainted. Sweden is not escaped here, but rather revised, made in an image that Fikirte and Tudros can live in. This place is not utopian or an idol, as they are still unable to fully share with each other the racist abuse they both suffer. On these walks, Tudris tells Fakirte about the gang of boys taunting his family who throw rocks and stones at their house. Yet she does not share her story, merely listens, wondering if he's telling me this because he knows I am called such words every day. Slog ends with a devastating racist attack that sends Tudris to the hospital. He and Fakirte are overcome by a group on mopeds who surround them, call them the N-word repeatedly and predictably tell them to go back to Africa. This attack reorients time and space again and revises once again the images of themselves in Sweden that they had created. It is as if all that has happened in this city has now gone back, as if there wasn't real time, as if it was a dream and everything is exactly as dangerous as it has always been. After the attack, Fikirte cannot sleep at night and goes out to the forest behind her house and stands in front of a tree that's at the edge of the road. There's still a swastika swastika there that I've tried to rub out. Trees cannot heal wounds. They survive by encapsulating their injuries. And the Swedish is at kapslatin. People do too. As if to signal this incorporation and survival, the text doubles back to its beginning, literally. The first chapters of the book are repeated nearly word for word with slight differences functioning as its ending. Boxers train in intervals and slog is written in and is itself an interval in an Afro-Swedish life. Prakirte attempts to figure her belonging to her own body, to her environment, to her Ethiopianness and her Swedishness and to the blackness in which she is so violently interpolated. Her experience of blackness begins in the form of racist degradation, modifying and attempting to erase her Ethiopianness and Swedishness and replace it with a slur. But later intervals make possible the formation of a Swedish blackness or a black Swedishness that incorporates in both joyful and painful ways, the fullness of her identities differently and in community. Four, rhizomes, roots, traditions, inheritances, and futures. Prakirte's method of encapsulating her injuries is familiar to other Afro-Swedish writers who like Beza work Grönlund, 
chronicle difficult and devastating childhoods so that they can serve as an archive of trauma and resilience. Sweden's most well-known black artist, activist, and now memoirist and stage performer, hip hop star, Jason Timbuktu Diakite, has done the same with his memoir, Endrop Midnat, from 2016. And like Fakirte, he labors to encapsulate his experience of being Swedish and black into his own body, asking frequently and devastatingly throughout the text, how can I bear this blackness? The Swedish is at bara min fari. Like for Kirte, his childhood is marked by racist abuse and confusion over his mixed race, bicultural and bilingual identity. It is characterized by silence and silencing as he never tells his mother about being called the N-word daily for nearly five years. Like for Kirte, Jason learns blackness from his African-American father or from his father, his family history and hip hop and calls on diasporic resources to find a way to navigate between the feeling that his blackness is a burden, an obligation, a privilege, a responsibility and or a joy. In End Drop Midnight, Diakite endeavors not only to be black, but to bring that blackness to bear on his Afro-Swedishness. That is, he hopes to exemplify how an Afro-Swedishness can be created out of a journey into blackness, defying the fact that blackness in Sweden is meant to be a restrictive and reductive or non-existent category. As I analyze Slog and End Drop Midnight, I am interested in how, when and where Prakirte and Jason both become black Afro-Swedish and then black again. They do so when blackness is thrust upon them and also when they, is, when they choose to be inside of and in relation to what blackness means for other people proximate to them and also elsewhere. They do this via how blackness is expressed in and as art or other forms of expressive culture. Fikirte steps into blackness and Swedishness on Kungsgatan as if she's painting a new reality. Jason walks into a hip hop cipher in Lund, Southern Sweden with other immigrants rapping alongside a beat that is booming across the world from, to quote, a tribe called Quest, Chinatown, Spokane, London, and Tokyo. In these moments, they fall into socially conditioned and time-bound conceptions of racism and race, into a space-time in which blackness captures, eludes, or is elided and reformed again. As Jason quotes Rakim in his memoir, translated to English last year, black is black, not blue or purple, being black is like a circle. Diakite's Ross Riasa, or racial journey in Endrop, involves a transformation in the way he which thinks about race, racial identity, and blackness. In order for him to bear his color and perform all the meanings of the word, where his blackness proudly understand and tolerate its history, and also embody and create his own future as black, he journeys through different racial rhetorics and expressions of what we might call the materiality of race or blackness. For him and many Swedes, race and blackness is talked about and envisioned as a surface, as skin color or hud fari. What distinguishes Swedes of African descent at a most basic level is in fact their skin color, their appearance, their visual and visible difference from the white majority. In an overwhelmingly white country, this was especially so when Diakite was growing up, whiteness and Swedishness were indelibly intertwined. As he says himself, I imagined that if you are Swedish, you are white. In fact, when Swedes talk about difference, they often frame it exclusively in opposition to whiteness and use the descriptor not white or ikivita to capture all forms of racial otherness, including differences in culture and history. In Sweden in the 1970s, for sure, definitions belonged to the definers. Rather than identifying someone or, or something as black, one might just as often identify the person or thing as ikivit, not white. We see a version of this in the way that Diakite begins his book with the question about bearing his skin color and not, for example, being black. He does this because in a Swedish context, blackness must be born, taken on, reconciled with as, explicit, as an explicit and meaningful non-whiteness. Diakite makes two journeys into black culture, the first through hip hop and its narratives of race and place, and another more literal and much later excursion into his family's history, particularly in the American South. He journeys to understand where his melanin comes from and the multiple things it can mean, who and what it connects into outside of Sweden and how it impacts his sense of belonging to blackness, whiteness, and Swedishness. Hip hop arrives in his hometown of Lund and comes to define his life thanks to a cousin visiting from Fort Greene in 1989 and the eventual globalization of MTV. This cousin initiates him into a dynamic, into a, into a world of dynamic language, pulsating rhythms and a sense of blackness is conscious conveying and containing vital cultural knowledge. 
Impressed by the bravado and self-confidence of Chuck D, Q-Tip, Grand Puba, KRS-One, and Guru, Diakite fell in love with rap and hip hop, with black culture, with his skin color, and ultimately himself. The music was a gateway into a culture that was and is supremely dynamic, necessarily responsive to racism, and simultaneously also productive of race, I mean, of pride of race in place. Diakite's black circle includes, interestingly and importantly, a middle space, perhaps ironic or fitting given the shape of a circle, and one that is not necessarily subsumed by blackness as an in as an endpoint or sense of a whole. Inside of the circle of blackness between and among shame and pride for Diakite is what he and others called melanfoschkop, or betweenness, a state of being between races, between cultures, between sameness and difference as experienced in a bifurcated Swedish society with a stark racial regime. After a childhood characterized by a desperation to be white and undeniably Swedish, and a teenage phase in which blackness, in particular black Americanness, was preeminent as an identity model. Diakite allows himself later in life to explore his biraciality and bicultural heritage. Diakite's melanfoschkopet, or betweenness, is multifaceted in which race, culture, and nationality intertwine and is for him seemingly a facet or fact of his blackness, part of the circle. This between blackness is not equivalent to the stereotypical, personal, or historic qualities of blackness that Diakite comes to define and live them, nor it is the same as the black Americanness that he learns, claims, and modifies. Rather, it is inside his circle and constitutive of it. Dekite's writing is also, cosmo also a cosmopolitan story of black migration, roots and roots, the OOTS and OUTS, diasporic resources and global exchanges of black arts and culture. As such is an Afro-Swedish narrative and of course a black diasporic one. The blackness that Diakite De, De claims is not only circular, but rhizomatic. It is diverse, worldly, open, trans and multicultural and against authenticity. It is a blackness that is otherwise respectful of the past and of place, but future oriented in space and time. Diakite's book begins with a meditation on his grandfather Silas's overcoat, one of the very few material things that he inherited from him. As such, his attention to lineage brings us back to Woodson's words, which resonate at the end of Diakite's book, across the ocean, calling up past and future generations. My grandfather coughs again, and the earth waits for what and who it will get in return. In the very beginning of Michelle Wright's, I'm almost done, 2004 book, Becoming Black, Creating Identity in the African Diaspora, she meditates on another black author of Buildings Ramon, Jacob, Jamaica Kincaid. Describing her blackness and at the bottom of the river, Kincaid writes, the blackness is visible and yet it is invisible for I see that I cannot see it. The blackness fills up a small room, a large field, an island, my own being. The blackness cannot bring me joy, but I am often made glad in it. The blackness cannot be separated from me, but often I can stand outside of it. The blackness is not the air, though I breathe it. The blackness is not the earth, though I eat and drink it. The blackness enters my many tiered spaces and soon the significant word and event recedes and eventually vanishes. In this way, I am annihilated and my form becomes formless and I am absorbed, and I am absorbed into a vastness of free flowing matter. Wright sees this description of blackness as the inherent fluidity of blackness and its ability to harm and heal the black individual. In 2015's The Physics of Blackness, Wright pushes further into the space time of this conception as she imagines how many black Europe European people arrive at their subjectivity outside of what she calls a middle passage blackness and alongside and inside other paradigms. She sees that black people who were not caught up in the Atlantic slave trade become black via exchanges of and amendments to ethnicity and nationality and radical and sometimes desperate solidarity with others elsewhere and sometimes elsewhere. In Physics of Blackness, she goes on to call for a focus on the phenomenology of blackness, that is when and where it is being imagined, defined and performed and in what locations, both literal and figurative in order to get away from thinking of it as a limiting what. This opens blackness up to being a coherent diversity defined by specific modalities that might be capacious enough to account for actually and metaphorically the teleology of these buildings, Ramon, and the rhizomatic dynamics of contemporary diasporic Black consciousness. Black bildung is happening everywhere, at different moments and in different places, 
and that these are and these are related under the rhizomatic category of blackness. I see this form of contemporary black identity formation as having the capacity to create an aliveness that stays ahead of a deadly and deadening invisibilizing curve wherever that curve is sighted. This blackness is based on and eschews simple returns, rethinks roots, traditions, inheritance, and Afro futures. This way of thinking blackness also makes possible an inquiry into not only a sense of a coherent yet rhizomatic form of global black aesthetics, but also per perhaps an intriguing sense of an aesthetic citizenship for black people in places with and without race. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll get started with the question and answer. Um, may I ask the panelists to turn on your cameras and use the raised hand function. Um, I will then call on you to unmute and ask your question. All other audience members may submit their questions uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So with that, um, questions from the panelists as well as the chat. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about your process of writing. And I was thought it was really interesting, this idea about the exchange between Woodson and the cultural minister. There was like something that she couldn't say or quite connect to in the blackness that was articulated in Woodson's work. Sure. And I guess I was wondering how that translates to your process as a writer in, you know, capturing diaspora and these experiences of blackness that are largely um, unspoken. Um, and in thinking about that, maybe you could also talk a little bit about the other objects, so to speak, that you um, turn to in that analysis. I know in this presentation, the novel and memoir was especially important. That's a great question and allows me to say a bunch of stuff I didn't say at the beginning of the talk. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I landed on, um, I landed on the first version of this particular chapter was really about Swedish childhood, right? And Afro-Swedish childhood, which I mean, as I was mentioning, um, I feel like is, uh, th there's a lot, I mean, th this happens everywhere, but it has a specific valence in Sweden. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of talk about race that isn't actually sp spoken, right? Um, that children are around in here, right? So it's like, I mean, when I was talking about the kind of racial po racial politics of belonging, that's in some ways what I meant about that kind of like field, right? That that everybody's inside of, right? Where all of those, all of that conversation is actually happening, but we don't, you know, we either choose to hear it, not hear it, hear parts of it, right? I mean, as both children and adults. So, um, so I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about that as you can just say, like how I started this project at all. Um, I, um, I started thinking about it in relationship to my own children. Um, I'm married to a Swedish man. We spend a lot of our time, um, all of the time that we're not in New York, we're in Sweden, um, you know, sabbaticals every summer, it's been 20 years or so, right? And um, our kids really identify as, as Swedish and, and black, he's white, um, Swedish and black. So, I mean, I, part of this project really started with me just observing, right? Um, you know, being inside of the Swedish welfare state as a parent, of a, of a biracial, bicultural, bilingual child, right? And, um, and, and how that, how, what that was like in relationship to like a rapidly changing demographic, right? Um, demographic in a country that has, has very little language for talking about race and blackness, right? So that's, that's where it came. So the silence is something that um, I've actually been trying to fill in for myself personally, right? And that's kind of where this project comes, comes out of. Um, when I started just to do this work, I was working with, luckily, um, uh, I kind of bungled into a group of, um, once when we were in Sweden for a year, a, a group of Afro-Swedish um, cultural workers, right? So actors, directors, um, media folks, a couple of, uh, a couple of um, uh, academics, um, folks who are actually not silent, right? So, so it was actually really, really wonderful. Um, uh, to actually start working with a group of people who really wanted to articulate, right, um, uh, their sense of being Black and Swedish, but 
many of whom this is the first they they are the first group to ever organize right in this way um, as as black people right doing culture work um, they wanted to articulate but had never done that before and they had never done it before actually in community right so um, so what was really really fascinating for me was to actually to listen to their conversations with each other about their identities which were really diverse i mean it's 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 kind of you cannot overstate like how diverse the group was they all came to think about themselves or they were trying to think about themselves as black coming from all kinds of different kind of ethnic ethnic ethnicities right um Black ethnicities and also different social positions, right? So, like as I was saying before, adopted, mixed race, um, refugee, immigrant, right? Um, you know, class makes a big difference in all of that. So, so I was just listening to their conversations, realizing that there was a there were blacknesses being formed in the room, right? Um, that were really contested. Not everybody agrees. Like, I mean, I'm using language in this paper that is not that is not that not everybody would agree with right when i say the word afro swedish that's not how everybody's identifying but i'm using that right um so it, it's about it was it's sort of like it was like a tuning right that i that i had to listen and also when i was realizing that i was like wow this is really presenting me with um a way of thinking about identity um that is different from what i grew up with right really different and i had to sort of unlearn in some ways, what I had been what I had been taught, right, in order to actually hear, right, um, what was falling into the gaps, right, of either my Swedish and their English, or you know what was falling into the gaps of either their inability to express, or my like you know both a linguistic and experiential uh, kind of aporia, right. So um, yeah, so that I mean that's sort of that's sort of how how that came about. Um, other objects. Um, I also began this work thinking I really needed to, um, uh, I really needed to think much more socially scientifically, right? The only, the very little work that's being done um, had been done, it's different now, when I started this book ages ago, um, was um, around race in Sweden, was really like sociology. It was about like, you know, how are the immigrants doing? You know, how do they identify? Right. I mean, it, it was really just about that, but that was where I had to start because that was where, like, I was just getting information about, um, you know, numbers of people, like, you know, where are they? You know, where, I mean, what, where, like, where are they located? Um, so I started that, and then I realized that 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 was a lot of that work was not getting at the kinds of experiences that I was that I was most interested. In. Like, you know, we're not hearing that that those words in the gaps, right? Um, and I realized that I really wanted to connect with people who were making art, right? This kind of cultural worker idea, right? So I, I look at novels, um, a little bit of music. I work very closely with these actors who during the course of the time that I was working really closely with them, managed to mount um, the first play with an all black cast, all black director on a national stage in Sweden, right? Um, I, I look at um, some visual artists, some of whom are very controversial um who work in blackface um i look at um so i'm so i'm looking at these like different cultural objects to sort of tap into on the one hand uh the conversations that they are having with other swedes both black and white as well as conversations they are having about blackness outside in the diaspora right and what that what that conversation might have to tell us and i mean in some ways so people always ask me like what's the like, what does this book have to tell America, <laughs> right? Um, what that book might have to tell us about, like, uh, I think the dynamism, right, of, of Blackness and its continual formation, which I think, um, which is something I'm really trying to tap into, like by using this kind of figure of the rhizome, right? Because I'm interested in the way that it expands in space and time, but also is kind of tied to something kind of um, both in some ways natural and, and in some ways, um, almost like technological, right? So and there's a long answer to your question. That's, that's <laughs> great. May I ask uh, Catherine to share a question? And then we also have questions from Aaron and Meredith as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I think Meredith was first. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was in keeping track. Sure, thanks so much, Monica. Um, I, I, as an Americanist, I was particularly tuned in to the connections that you were 
um, making between um, Diakite's inspiration from his cousin from Fort Greene and how he got really into hip hop, mm -hmm. um, and also the award, uh, this, the, the literature award to uh, Jacqueline Woodson. And, and I was wondering um, if you could say a little bit more about the, the kind of connection that some um, Swedes of African descent feel particularly with um, African American culture. Um, and, and also if there are other locations within the diaspora that they're looking to outside of, of the US that are particularly influential yeah. or important. Yeah, I mean, American, Black American culture just dominates. I mean, it really dominates um, the scene. I would say that, you know, maybe, I'm gonna say like in the 80s and 90s, there was this kind of transformation where the kind of English language culture in Sweden went from British culture to American. Right, so like American popular culture and um, you know TV, movies, whatever, really, really dominate um, uh, Swedish uh, Swedish kind of media worlds, right? So, so the so there's there's so much of American culture, right? Um, in Swedish culture, um, even you know words that have come in, you know languages, and people are you know continually upset about this. Um, I mean, I would say amongst the kind of uh, Black community, if I can talk about it that way. Um, African-American culture is huge, right? Because one of the things that folks always say to me, right, is that, you know, African-America has been through, or the United States has been through a rights movement, been through the civil rights movement. So, so much of the language that um, they want to use, right, to talk about, um, you know, what's necessary, what they would want, what kinds of demands come out of that, um, come out of that tradition. And then, you know, from the civil rights movement to the to the black power movement to then thinking about hip hop and um, uh, uh, cultural formations that come out of hip hop and rap, right? So, it's it's it, you can't really. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to state like how how big that is, right? But folks also say to me, especially because so many of the folks, so many of the Afro Swedish people in Sweden have have roots in Africa, right? They're often always complain about the way that those cultural references erase, right? The dominance of those cultural references from the United States erase, um, uh, erase other African movements, right? That might be that might be useful to them as what I'm calling, you know, as what what I used uh, the term that I used in my talk about diasporic resources, right? So this routing through America means that Africa gets lost in the conversation for them, right? So there are so many folks who are trying to find ways to kind of like think about think about Africa as as equal as equal a resource, right? Um, and I think you know folks manage it. I mean, there's there's a kind of West African. There's a lot of folks from um, from Ghana and the Gambia. Um, so there's there's kind of a West African um, uh, and increasingly Nigerian folks, right? That are that are resident there. So so that's that's beginning, right? But but just the U.S. dominates. So one of the things that's really frustrating for activists there, in particular, right, is is to try to is to try to use that, right? But in but to use that, right? But but really kind of blend it through, right? Um, local circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. um, for me, I had to make a choice. When I first started this book, I actually didn't wanna have anything African-American in it like because I was really trying to be in this process of unlearning, but it actually, it, it actually made sense for me, especially as I started working more ethnographically for me to narrate, right? To the different audiences that I'm trying to talk to, right? One of which is an American audience and the other one is which Swedish, right? So to be, for me to be in the book in a certain way, like with that observation that they have at the beginning between Woodson and Bakunke, for me to be in the book allows me to 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 stage those conversations, right? And to stage stage the um, you know what is similar and what is different, what is what is useful to either either of those groups. So um, so I ended up having to to do that more, um, which is turning out okay. <laughs> Catherine and then Aaron. Yeah, thank you so much, Monica. Uh, the things that Drew and you and Meredith have been talking about actually um, relate to something that I, I was specifically interested in after hearing you and Meredith talk before we got started, which is the relationship between your research and your teaching. Oh. Um, and you're teaching in Black cultural studies, you're teaching in, um, I think, contemporary Black literature. Yeah. Um, this kind of questions of terms and what you focus on uh, was really interesting to me. I'm wondering how that plays out in those in that context. 
Well, unfortunately, I'm not doing a lot of teaching right now, which mm -hmm. is painful to me, but um, <laughs> as a dean in COVID times, um, mm -hmm. not a lot of teaching happening. But I can say that um, what I what I what I have been teaching when I get the chance and it's like once a year, right, is um, is really about this it, It's really focusing for me on this di idea of blacknesses, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really, I'm really pushing hard on that, right? And not, and and thinking about it, you know, yes, about kind of transnationalism, thinking about, um, uh, thinking about kind of globalized context, but but asking folks to sort of like, you know, what what could this mean, right? What what could this term mean? How could it be useful, right? How is it actually not useful? Because for some people, politically, it would not be a useful term, right? Um, so so I'm trying to think about courses where where that's, that's part of the question, right? So I teach a class on um, Black European cultural studies that's, that's really does that work, right? Where we look at, um, we look at different um, artists and movements and in, in, in really different, um, where, where what's thought of as Blackness and how Blackness is apprehended is really different in national contexts, right? So looking at, you know, France versus Sweden or the Netherlands or Italy, Right. These these are really different. Um, at the same time, they're all really united by being, you know, places, you know, colonized and you know, colonized places and imperial places. Right. So so there's the sameness and difference ends up being really um, being really um, useful. Um, the other thing I can say that was really exciting is that Jason Diakite was was here right before COVID. Um, uh, mounting a stage version of his memoir at the Harlem stage um, up in Harlem. And he was a part of a course that I was teaching where it was a kind of globalized Harlem Renaissance where yeah. we talk about the Harlem Renaissance and aesthetics and performance um, from that moment to his piece, right? I mean, because his piece is so much about his father growing up in Harlem, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and his father has an incredibly, um, his father's African-American, but his mother he spent some time as a teenager growing up in Nigeria. Um, his grandmother um, was part of the um, uh, part of the liberation movement of Guinea, right? So there's there's just a tremendous amount happening there. So I was really interested in thinking about um, across time, right? Harlem as a site mm -hmm. of um, of this kind of global blacknesses conversation, mm -hmm. right? And and what kind of art that fueled, right? So, um, so that but you know we were interrupted by COVID, which was a disaster, but you know so but so, so, going back. <laughs> so was that part of the harlem semester initiative yes, yes it was okay. absolutely part of the harlem yeah. semester. so yeah. um so um you know it was a great it was a great um idea that i'm hoping we can bring back yeah. the show is going to come back to harlem stage so that'd be wonderful thank yeah. you great. great and aaron thanks so much for the talk um in a way i i, I would i'm going to ask you to go back to something you said at the beginning of the talk yeah. but also part of your answer to Drew's question in which you talked a little bit more about your own experience mm -hmm. spending time in Sweden. So one of the, th and then you brought up yourself that you, as you entered this project, you were thinking sort of in a social science, mm -hmm. social science register. So the, the part of the beginning of your talk that I wanna ask about was when you said that part of the, part of the, the failure or the lack of realization of multiculturalism as a policy in Sweden mm -hmm. was the sort of top down bureaucratic structure of it and the lack of kind of civic engagement and public discourse. And so my, my question was going to be about your own <laughs> ethnographic experience, by which I don't mean like, uh, you know, social scientific methodology. I mean, your own, your own experience on the ground there. Yeah. Um, um, you gave us a very compelling reading of these texts with in terms of these ideas of rhizomatic connection and mm -hmm. as motifs and and the sort of tropic landscape that's being yeah. activated but i'm curious to know whether the reception of the texts is starting to produce that civic discourse that might meet multiculturalism you know right. in the middle and what what kinds of real world effects these texts and the right. artists and the kinds of things you're analyzing how their circulation is, is mm -hmm. or is it actually, is, I guess the question, yeah. is it making some inroads in that, in that um, civic discourse? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really great question. And um, I have to say, like, even as I, was, as I was writing this chapter and then kind of revising it over the last couple of years, like the number of memoir has exploded, right? I mean, I mean, everybody, any person who's black in Sweden and is 50 years old is writing a memoir right now. I mean, it's, it's like really, that's, 
I mean, it's just, they just keep coming. And um, which I think, which is an amazing thing. Like, I mean, when I first started this project, um, you know, uh, I was, I spent a year um, around a year in the in the um, in the Royal Library, just kind of like calling up anything and everything I could about um, about race and blackness in Sweden, written by black people. I mean, I, I could I I could almost covered it. I mean, that's I mean, but now I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to do that um, in the same way. I mean, there's still some uh, very limited. I mean, opportunities are still relatively limited for things like writing a novel or making a film or um or putting up an art installation this doesn't happen every day but there's much more of it right um and whether or not it's having an effect i mean you know jason was just here we last week and we had we we had a conversation about like what is what is what it's been like in sweden and since the since the end of um since the summer of 2020 and the sort of globalized black lives black lives matter movement um you know, Swedish youth organizing is very sophisticated as it is here, right? Um, so there's there's a Black Lives Matter movement in Sweden that um, that um, had a number of really um, you know huge demonstrations and a lot of a lot of work um, was done. Um, but just as here, like the kind of conversations that we've had around critical race theory, um, there was a there is and continues to be a huge backlash against that. Um, you know, folks are not interested in the folks who lead institutions, who lead cultural institutions, um, had a moment when they were really kind of open to thinking about diversity or thinking about, you know, um, multiculturalism again, right? I mean, it's sort of like, I mean, thinking about ways that that could impact it. And then there, that, that moment came and went pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, I mean, for it, it's interesting to me because I feel like there's a growing cultural archive, right? More books, um, you know, more music, more, um, you know, but but how that's seeping into like the majority culture, um, I feel like there's a block there, right? Um, and I mean, it has to do partly. It has to. It has to do with a lot of things. Um, some of which we're familiar with here, right? Um, you know, but it also has to do with I think. Um, you know, a resistance in Sweden to talking about race. I mean, race as a category does not really exist there. And, um, you know, people keep trying to bring it in um, or point out that it does, um, which is what I'm doing, right? And saying it has, it always has. Sweden is not outside of the world, right? I mean, um, just because the word Ross does not mean the same thing as race doesn't mean we can't talk about, you know, um, race and racism. Racism exists, but race does not. So, um, you know, I mean, I feel like, I feel like the answer to your question is yes and no, right? I mean, for those of us who are looking for all of these books, right, um, who are going to all of these seminars, who are going to, you know, it seems like, you know, a, a, a certain form of renaissance, right? But I'm gonna say 90 plus percent of people, 90, even maybe 98% of people in Sweden have no idea and actually don't need to have an idea, right? So. I know we're short on time, but we do have some questions from the audience that I, I would like to share. Um, we have a question from Mina Lee. Um, she says that um, she would like you to talk maybe a little bit about, and you do, about how you get interest, got interested in Sweden. Um, she heard a talk uh, that the artist Amy Sherrill gave uh, about her time as a fellow in Northern Europe. And she talked about how she felt more American when she was living outside of the US. And, for uh, Mina, your talk expands this idea and makes um, the idea of identity much more multivariable and complex. And she was just wondering if you could discuss um, this a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel very American when I'm in Sweden um, and um, and have to make a lot of choices about whether I'll be speaking Swedish or English, right? Um, uh, you know, on the, on. I mean, speaking, going back to the very beginning when, when thinking about, um, you know, being with my kids when they were younger on the on the you know on the playground, I would I would very much talk to them in English so that people would understand me as a foreigner, but of a, a but um, an American foreigner, which is which is a, of a you know a higher a higher right um, because Americans are kind of beloved in Sweden. Um, um, it would just get me a lot of get me out get me out of a lot of trouble and away from certain forms of racism, right? So. Um, so um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated, right? And um, I don't ever not feel American when I'm there. Um, and I understand my Americanness, as I said before, it like affords me certain privileges, right? That other Afro-Swedish people don't have. Um, but, it, but it is, I also understood, and I think part of this project has helped me to understand, um, has helped me to understand and, and articulate more how I also never felt black in the US, like in ways that were typical, right? I mean, I personally, I mean, I grew up in, um, uh, my family is kind of multiracial. I grew up in a suburb, suburbs in Connecticut, but my family has been there for, you know, 400 years. I mean, I, I so there's a way in which the kind of like this idea of blackness is, is something that I've felt, um, and, and have been looking for others, right, in some ways, and understanding that there are many others, even, even others who grow up in what we think of as stereotypical or, um, or have kind of, you know, heritages like, like Woodson's, right? She comes out of the South from, from, from um, you know, from North Carolina, um, that, that all of this is different, right? That, there's, that there's, there is a multiplicity and even the thing that you think is most, is, is the most definitional version right, of, of the idea of blackness, right? So when I, when I started reading about, um, when I started reading Michelle Wright, where she was talking about, you know, blackness as a when, right, and a where instead of a what, that made a lot of sense to me, right? And it made sense to me in terms of the ways that I could also understand what were sort of anomalous, um, so-called anomalous or like really different expressions of blackness, whether that was like embodied or in art, right? So, um, you know, there's, there was a way in which that, uh, there's a way in which it, it, it made a certain amount of sense um, and was open, right? And expansive in ways that I, that I, I wanted, you know, in ways that I, I wanted to be in community, right? Or felt I could be, right, um, in, in community. Well, we're out of time, so I, I wanna thank, um... Dr. Miller for joining us today, as well as to the audience. And I encourage everyone to, um, to look to the schedule for future talks that will be coming about. Um, but again, thank you so much for your presentation so and for putting these ideas onto the table. Thank you so much. Great questions. I really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Bye.